taking our figures So many haters don't like us raking papers When all we did was bring garbage proof From the underground straight to you they Used to want a screw and bow Now they wanna join the crowd <laughs> Hello Monster Gardeners, welcome back to Test Lab. I'm your host Dr. Watt and today is part one of our 2015 single-ended mega test. This part on high pressure sodium bulbs. Now before we get started, if you haven't seen the Test Lab video, then you're probably wondering why you're listening to another Brit with a daft name. So click on the link at the bottom of the screen and it will be revealed. For those of you still here, let's get cracking. <laughs> Here at Test Lab, one of our aims is to create a regular schedule of tests so that we can perform the same tests year after year. That way we can track existing lamp technologies and their improvements over time. The first of these tests will be our annual single-ended mega test, which comprises of two parts. Part one is 601,000 watt high pressure sodium bulbs and part two is 601,000 watt metal halide bulbs. HPS bulbs are one of two varieties of sodium vapour lamp, which is a gas discharge technology that uses sodium in an excited state to produce the light. The other sort of sodium vapour lamp is low pressure sodium, which while highly efficient, is pretty much useless for growing as 90% of its light is in the 600 nanometer range. HPS technology has been with us for quite some time now, but its original application was street lighting which eventually transitioned into supplemental lighting in greenhouses to try and make up for winter months, before of course moving fully indoors. In order to understand how grow lighting affects your plants, I'm in a glass case of emotion! It's important to understand the basics of how these bulbs work. So here's a quick overview. The source of the light itself is actually an electrical arc, which is being drawn through an amalgam of metallic sodium and mercury vapour. To get the electrical arc started, low pressure xenon gas is usually used as a starter gas, as it has the lowest thermal conductivity and ionisation potential of all the non-radioactive noble gases. This low ionisation potential causes the breakdown voltage also known as the striking voltage, to be relatively low in a cold state, which allows the lamp to be more easily started. Once the xenon has been struck, this in turn helps the sodium mercury amalgam strike and the bulb begins its warm up cycle. During this phase, the ballast gradually increases the current, thereby allowing the chemical reaction within the tube to slowly intensify. The reaction inside the tube is actually being very carefully balanced by the electronic ballast in order to keep the amalgam in a liquid state. If the current is too high, then the amalgam begins to evaporate, which can damage the lifespan of the bulb and in worst case scenarios, kill it completely. If the current is too low, on the other hand, the arc will simply extinguish. Keeping this balance allows lamps to run for around 20,000 hours, but that's 20,000 hours of continuous operation. It is actually far less with the switching on and off that you do every day. This means that the ballast has a very large impact on bulb life, which causes problems when it comes to testing. Obviously, there's simply no way to test every combination of bulb, ballast and fixture that's available on the marketplace, as there's simply too vast an array of components to choose from. So what do we do? Well, because we're primarily interested in real world tests and trying to recreate your grow conditions, we didn't want to optimize the test the way we would say for a commercial grower, because they have access to resources that small growers simply do not. What we wanted to show you instead were the realistic sorts of results you could expect from the bulbs under non-optimized conditions. And so we raided Monster Garden's used stand within the store and picked up a couple of used Lumatech electronic ballasts and an old sunlight supply hood. Once we tested them to make sure they were both safe and within spec, we got down to business.
For this test, we're going to be using our 25 point canopy test at a height of 24 inches. Again, trying to mimic common indoor practices. The set time parameters for this test are as follows. We have a 15 minute warm up for the bulb, 30 seconds in between samples to allow each reading to settle. So that equates to around 60 minutes per test, including setup, centering, and finding the spectrometer's integration time for each bulb. The data we'll be collecting is as follows. Recorded test data includes the 25 spots on the 5x5 grid from 24 inches, the canopy average, which is the 25 spots added together then divided by 25, the uniformity ratio, which is the most intense spot on the grid, divided by the least intense spot on the grid, the voltage and wattage being drawn by the bulb, and the spectrometer's integration time, measured in milliseconds, which is basically our way of tuning out many of the variables caused by the grid, the ballast and the bulb in combination. Now, because of the sensitivity of our test, we'll also be giving you recorded conditions data, including air temperature both inside and outside the tent, the humidity percentage both inside and outside the tent, and the air pressure measured in hectopascals. <laughs> And so on to the results. For this first test at 600 watts, we tested the top five selling bulbs in the first half of the year on the Monster Gardens website. And they are the GE Luca Locks, the Sunmaster Super HPS, the Philips Master Son T, the i Hortelux Super HPS, and the Genesis HPS. It was a really, really close test which means that conditions on the day may well have dictated the winner here. There was under 30 micromoles between the top and bottom positions. Fifth place was a surprise considering their excellent reputation. It was the Philips Sontee. However, in the interest of fairness, I do need to point out that the voltage and wattage figures suggest that the electrical grid could have been slightly unstable for this part of the test. As in normal conditions, we'd expect over 210 volts and at least something approaching 620 watts. In fourth place was the GE Lucalox, which had the most uniform footprint of the test, with the ratio between the maximum and minimum intensity spots being only 6.04. In third place was the Genesis HPS, which exhibited a similar electrical drop as the Philips bulb. Considering it placed third despite this handicap, I must admit I'd love to do a retest of this bulb, but considering this insane schedule of tests I've got lined up, sadly it won't be for a while. In second place was the Sunmaster Super HPS, which although it had the second best canopy average, its uniformity ratio was let down by the reading in spot 21. We retested this spot several times in order to make sure that the cosine wasn't giving us a dodgy sample, but it was 57 micromoles at the highest. When we pulled the bulb, we did notice that the electrode was oriented in that direction, which could explain the odd reading. In first place was the iHortelux Super HPS, which sneaked the win by 0.06 micromoles on the canopy average. This test could easily be completely different on a different day with different conditions, as it was so, so very close. But there has to be a winner, and in this test, it was the Hoylux. Moving on to the 1000 watt category, this test is actually a little bit different. As with the 600 watt bulbs, we wanted to test the top five sellers on Monster Garden's website, but sadly not all were available to fit our schedule. So we made a few calls and a couple of bulb manufacturers stepped up to fill the void. So we actually have six bulbs in this test. They are the iHortelux Super HPS, the Genesis HPS, the Ushio Hilux Grow HPS, and the Optilum HPS, all of which Monster Garden sells. The potential spoilers are the Solistech HPS and in an exclusive of this test, Genesis gave us their 2016 formula to test. I'm super excited about seeing the numbers. I'd like to thank Genesis and Solistech for stepping up and helping out with this problem. And so on to the results. In sixth place was the Octilum HPS with a canopy average of 453.4 micromoles. In fifth, 
Another of the test surprises, the Ushio Hilux Grow. With a canopy average of 455.1 micromoles, I was quite surprised by this as I understood Ushio to be one of the leaders in the industry. Perhaps conditions on the day affected the results for the Ushio, but regardless, it placed fifth in this particular test. In fourth place was one of our test spoiler bulbs, the Solistec HPS, with its canopy average of 462.3 micromoles. In third place is the Legacy Genesis HPS bulb. This was the High Times Stash Award winning bulb from 2013, so with it placing third it means the game must have moved on in the last two years. In second place, the iHortlux Super HPS, beating out the old Genesis bulb by an average of 20 micromoles, and it has the test's best uniformity ratio. And that means that our 1000 watt winner is the Generation 2 Genesis bulb. And it's not just a win, it's a mauling. A quite staggering 45 micromoles average over the Hortolux. The intensity in the center nine spots is quite frankly mind-boggling. And I even had to retest it a few times in order to check the connections and make sure that the spectrometer was functioning properly. It was. We reached out to a very smug Genesis rep who confirmed that this is their latest arc chemistry fresh out of their R&D lab and it's actually just entering manufacturing ramp up at the moment. I've been told to keep an eye out for a launch announcement very very soon so you should too. So that's it for the mega test part one. I know you've all been screaming for these results and that they're a little bit later than I promised. Please accept my humblest apologies for this. But we've actually been a victim of our own success. After the launch of Test Lab in the last video, we've been inundated with requests to see the facility. Oh, and there has been a tiny spot of bother with some new YouTube terms of service that didn't help. But we do hear you and I'm testing as fast as physically possible. So until part two, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.